So the title of my talk is uh, Optimal Tuning, but that might read really optimal post-processing of MCMC output uh, with application to cardiac electrophysiology. I will start with um, just a brief outline of my talk. So I'll first introduce the biological and the statistical framework um, for doing this, um, that will, and which will explain basically what's, what's the main problem, what we, what we want to do and what we can do with standard methods existing in the literature. And then I will um, show um, the new methodology that we developed uh, and present some results, both theoretical and empirical, and then I will conclude. So before starting, I would like to acknowledge uh, many collaborators on this project. So Wilson Chen from the University of Sydney in Australia and John Cocaine have helped with developing the code. Uh, Pavel Svetak from the University of Oxford has um, worked on data collection. So it's a real data problem on cardiac cells. And then Steve Niederer, Lester Mackey and Chris Holt uh, have supervised the uh, project either from a computational cardiology point of view or from a statistical point of view. So really thanks to, to these uh, people. And Lester will give us a seminar after me today. So he will have some interesting um, points to make as well. Um, so to start with, um, I will briefly uh, introduce what is computational cardiology to, to start with. So as Liz said, um, the end goal of modern um, methods in computational cardiology is to create what's called, what's today is called a digital twin of the, of the human, human heart. Uh, and uh, the end goal is basically to be able to predict uh, how a disease will develop and how a patient will respond to uh, different therapies without uh, actually having to um, give these therapies to the patient. So that uh, basically a possible therapy, an optimal therapy and all possible outcomes can be evaluated beforehand. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a um, three-dimensional uh, model of a human heart that has been developed in uh, Professor Niederer's uh, lab, so by, by um, people in my group. Um, and what they did here is coupling, uh, it's basically they coupled the mechanics uh, of the heart with electrophysiology and also with a circulation model uh, to get basically uh, three heartbeats. So the um, kind of um, main thing that I would like you to take from here is that up until recently, um, simplified models of the heart were available in which just the um, ventricles were modeled. So it's basically these two chambers while um, Fairly, fairly recently, uh, four chambers models of the heart of the heart have been developed, and it's possible now to run these very complicated simulations. Now, uh, one forward run of these takes uh, hours to to compute, and so it's a very it's a very um, computational intensive uh, problem in, that involves solving, as I said, lots of PDEs for the for the three-dimensional model, and then coupling different mechanics. So that's that's the end goal, and that's what we want. Of course, this model now represents a fixed set of parameters and personalizing or making a digital twin basically means um, finding parameters that best represent each patient so that we can give um, individual therapies. So um, to kind of have a big picture of what's going on and why I will actually talk about ODEs today is, um, as I was showing, we have a four chambers model of the heart. And uh, the, the, the organ is basically made up of tissues, and it, that tissue has um, cells, right? And so what happens is that uh, the cardiac function, so this contraction is actually uh, determined by the integrated um, action of many myocytes with so these long cardiac cells. Um, and uh, what, what happens in a single cell is also quite complicated, and that's, that's also that's where the OD parts come, come into, into play. Um, and basically what happens is that there are a lot of ions that go in and out from the cell and they're driven by uh, concentration gradients and um, uh, potential gradients. Um, but the most important ion that uh, determines the contraction is calcium. Uh, and I will explain briefly now why and how, how calcium determines contraction. But we uh, basically want to model to start with and to start simple, just, uh, just calcium. Um, the main questions that we want to tackle, or the main kind of goal that we um, would like to, 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 to achieve by uh, working at a single cell level are two. So first of all, we would like to infer what's the variability from one cell to another. And basically, 
try to relate this to pathologies. So there is this stunning hypothesis that extreme cells uh, might be related to um, atrial and ventric ventricular fibrillation. And the, um, basically extreme cells um, are also related to aging. So oh, basically all cells have different and extreme values or parameters. Um, so we, we, want to, we want to basically infer variability at a single cell, but we also want to infer what's happening at a single cell to then um, basically thinking about an experimental design setting, use uh, values that we have obtained at a cellular level to propagate uncertainty uh, through different scales. So in a tissue scale and then back in the heart, in the heart simulation. Um, and as I, as I was showing in the first slide, basically computational complexity increases as the scale increases. Um, so briefly, um, what happens with calcium and how, how, how that stimulates contraction? So um, basically, again, because of different gradients, calcium uh, comes into a cell through um, a protein. So uh, it's this L-type uh, calcium channel. Um, and then what happens is there is a bag of calcium inside the cell, inside, inside the cell. And when a tiny amount of calcium comes in, uh, that stimulates the release of calcium from this bag, which is called sarcoplasmatic reticulum, into the cytoplasm. And then we have a large amount of basically calcium going around the cell, and that, um, that basically binds to another protein called troponin that is inside the cell, and that's... Um, basically activate these um, filaments to contract. And that's, that's basically when, when the cell is contracting. And then the cycle uh, finishes with calcium going in, back inside the, this kind of bag yeah, of calcium and then out of the cell. So um, the kind of two key proteins here are uh, this gate that allows calcium to come in and then this other gate that allows calcium to come out from the sarcoplasmatic reticulum. And so the biologists, uh, and again, it's not my field, but I've learned biologists um, model these uh, proteins in different ways. And one way is basically to represent them um, with Markov models with three different states. So they can be either active, uh, either open, closed, or inactive. Uh, and there are different, say, different rates of transitions basically between these three states. And uh, to simplify things, because um, at the biological level, um, all these transactions uh, happen at different time scales, uh, it's possible to look at, um, maybe I'm gonna go back, at a basically simplified Markov model that um, kind of uh, simplifies the interaction of these two proteins in a, in a four state, um, in a four state Markov model with different transition rates. So to sum up, um, this is how um, our whole um, kind of biological model of a cardiac myocyte looks like with, uh, and these are the state variables. So those that I um, circled in red. So the three, uh, the proportion of uh, basically proteins that are in the different, uh, in, three, in the three different states of this um, four state Markov model. And the fourth one can be found as the sub subtraction basically. Uh, then the calcium that is internal to the sarcoplasmatic reticulum, the calcium free in the cytoplasm, and that the one that is bound to troponin. So this is one of the possible models um, that we chose uh, from the literature because um, it is accurate, but again, there are a number of models with similar interaction, similar representation. So what, what I did here is um, can be fairly easily generalized to those. So we have uh, six state variables, um, but from um, from an experimental point of view, we can measure just one, which is calcium um, in the cytoplasm. And uh, that, that's also not a direct, uh, direct measurement, but it's basically an indirect measurement by shining some, that's, that's obtained by shining some light to the cell and then this light comes back and then this concentration can be reconstructed, uh, shining lights, light at different frequencies, basically. Um, so, um, how the experiment was conducted is as follows. So um, we had uh, 25 cardiac cells coming from different um, rat hearts. So it's a rat model uh, of the cardiac cell. And basically each cell was uh, extracted from the heart and then put into this dish and then stimulated with, um, with a number of stimuli uh, that are either um, basically um, patch clamp, so the, a certain voltage was applied to the, to the cell. 
or a drug was applied to the cell. And the design of this experiment, again, was done by biologists, but the main, the main idea is that they did that in a way that was um, ideally going to block all the other ions because of course it's a real cell, so there is a lot, lot going on, but it's also um, aimed at maximizing the signal for the different proteins that I was talking about before. So, um, and again, this is, a, this, is a, this is a choice. So it's an experimental choice that biologists um, did. So um, this is how our data looks like. So what I'm mm, showing here, it's uh, the overlap of the 25 time series obtained by this, by this protocol. And as I said, what we're measuring in a, in a bit of an indirect way is calcium internal to the cell. And so we have three to seven minutes observation for, um, for, the, for this bulk of cells. And just to show how one of these cell looks like with uh, basically three different parts of the experimental protocol is as follows. So it's a very, it's a very structured signal. And again, these spikes correspond to basically voltages that were applied. And then the big spike here is caffeine, which was applied to the cell. Um, but if we look at the bulk of cells, we can see that there is quite some variability, even if these are all healthy, um, healthy cells. So for example, the spike related to caffeine is sometimes very large, sometimes very small and so on. Um, so um, how can we represent this from a statistical point of view? So statistically, so the, the kind of uh, mass kinetic action that I was talking about, um, it, that's, that's basically our biological model can be turned into an ODE um, set of equations. So um, we basically represent the six set variables over uh, U, right? And um, we assume that there is a non-initial condition, although we kind of let the system uh, reach steady state each time we run a forward simulation. Um, and so it's, um, it's a set of uh, six differential equation with known initial condition and um, a 38 dimensional parameters. So I'm not showing the vector field here because it's a couple of pages of equation. I'm not showing what the parameter is, but basically has a meaning of uh, geometric properties of the cell, conductances of uh, different proteins, uh, time scales at which things happen and so on. Um, and then, so this is the, the biological model. And then how can we relate that data that I was showing to this, to this biological model? That's through um, a Gaussian measurement error model. And again, we assume that the standard deviation of the instrument that was uh, basically collecting data is known, or we, we give a rough estimate of that. So we basically see that our data Y given X um, has this um, probability distribution. So typical Gaussian. Um, now, um, this is how uh, basically one forward run of the, of the set of ODs. So as I said, it's six differential equations, one forward run looks like. Uh, and we have data just for one of these states. And uh, it's basically what I was doing here was running the set of ODs in the um, parameters that are um, given in the literature. So it's possible to see that this cell is fairly well represented by those set of parameters. But of course, if this one is, the other, the other cells that I was showing were not, for example, those that had a very small spike in the caffeine, um, in the caffeine input. Uh, and so um, what's clearly, uh, clearly possible to see from here is that uh, the variability, um, uh, given, given that the set of OD, the ODE model is deterministic, um, to capture the variability of the data is that the kind of, it's not possible to use just the noise model and say there is some error in the measurements. Uh, but what we uh, want to do is basically to represent this variability by uh, inferring for each cell a set of parameters, so that set of 38 parameters, right? And, um, and doing that, we're basically solving an inverse problem. Um, we uh, use, we decide to use um, basically a Bayesian inference uh, to, to put ourselves in a Bayesian inference framework because um, that conveys, conveys naturally uh, basically how our prior on the parameters, which is basically the values that all the biologists have given in the literature can be updated once we have seen the data. And it does that in a way, um, in a way that provides uncertainty in quantification. So what we actually want to uh, find is a um, probability distribution for the parameters, so not just one point value. Um, and, uh, and we want to do this in, in following this principle framework. Um, as you might know, uh, the main 
uh, problem and the main technical challenge with Bayesian inference is that uh, although it's possible to usually write down the error model, so the, what I was showing earlier is this Gaussian, and although usually we have, we can write down also prior distribution for the parameters, this quantity, so the denominator, um, it's usually not possible to compute because it's a high dimensional uh, integral, basically of the numerator. Um, and Hence, it's not possible usually to uh, evaluate the distribution, but it's also not possible to obtain samples from that, um, which is what, what we want. So what our end goal is basically, when I say to obtain this distribution, means obtain a number of samples from, from the distribution. Um, now, it's possible to, as again, you might know, it's possible to solve this problem by using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, and then basically what these methods do uh, is to pr basically produce a sequence of random variables that have the Markov property. So that means that um, just the, the, each variable, it's a function of, uh, it's determined only by the variable at the previous time step. Uh, and they require only evaluation of the normalized, of the normalized uh, posterior distribution. So um, in theory, they do work. In practice, uh, it can be challenging to, to tune these algorithms. Um, and I will show uh, basically the few, the few problems that we faced in, in this concrete application, but um, people that have tried to use MCMC probably know that it's, it's uh, um, tuning an, an MCMC method is usually problem dependent. Um, so in our case, uh, we um, think that the parameters, um, uh, so this, the parameters uh, live in a manifold, so the posterior distribution, um, uh, it's, it's so that the parameters are basically coupled together. And um, an idea of that is given by basically a thresholded um, Fisher information matrix. So this matrix is a, this matrix is a 38 by 38 matrix. Um, and um, it's basically proportional to the inverse posterior covariance at that point of the parameter space. So here we were looking at the literature values. And the fact that we, after thresholding this matrix, basically we see these structures popping out means that uh, some of the parameters are correlated with some others. Um, and so if we perform, uh, if we use basically MCMC methods that are based on gradients, on evaluation of gradients of the posterior distribution, we can end up, so we can um, take steps that are too large and they tend to lead to rejection basically of the proposal. So again, I'm not giving details here, but if you, if you, if you want more details, I have some other slides. Um, and so it's kind of difficult to tune, to tune these methods that are based on gradients. Um, moreover, if we, um, again, would like to um, use gradient-based MCMC methods, they require computing sensitivities of the ODE and this increases the cost. Um, and finally, uh, what happens is that uh, we have a parameter space uh, that after some transformation becomes unconstrained, but there are actually constraints on the parameters. Uh, and it, it's possible that the solver uh, breaks and uh, kind of um, uh, the solver fails. And the way we decided to tackle this was to use those parameters as uh, rejected states in the uh, parameter in the, in the MCMC. Uh, however, this is not um, kind of the correct way to do that, and it does introduce some bias in the in the output. Um, so we decided basically to proceed with simple MCMC, so run the MOOC metropolis phase things, uh, and we ran a few weeks of simulations. So this is what uh, the trace plots of the state of the parameters look like. So in the kind of full picture, we will have 38 of these plots. Uh, and they represent basically the, um, the evolution of the parameters along the uh, algorithm iteration. Now, uh, what's uh, the kind of um, golden rule for a good MCMC uh, output is that that looks like a fat caterpillar. And that means that uh, the Markov chain has explored well the parameter space and the samples are fairly independent, which is clearly not happening here. However, if we um, pick some of these uh, samples, and then we run the model, we uh, actually see that uh, the, the kind of uh, ODE solver fits quite well the data. So there is some information in these runs, which is something that we kind of managed to achieve after half a year of trying different MCMC methods, and then we decided to go simple. There is some information, but it has clearly not converged too well. So the question is, um, how can we extract this information in a meaningful way? 
And so that leads to the second part of the talk, which is uh, this uh, the new method that I'm going to talk about, and it's called optimal uh, thinning of MCMC output. So um, again, to, to sum up the notation and um, have a, a summary of the problem. So what we um, would like to do is to remove a bias from an MCMC output and also provide a compressed representation of this output. So, and the reason why we want to provide a compressed representation is, for example, if we think about um, forward uncertainty quantification that I was talking about earlier. So um, incorporating the cell model into tissue and into whole organ, uh, we don't want to have too many of these samples because uh, computational complexity increases as the scale increase. Um, so let's say that we have a distribution PFP interest and then, um, a set of n samples from a p invariant Markov chain. So this n is now seen to be fixed. So we have run simulations for a few weeks and we're not uh, ready to run them for longer because we wouldn't know in any case when to stop. Um, so if we didn't pro if we didn't post process this output, uh, and so we approximated the posterior distribution with a uh, um, basically sum of delta functions in the kind of in the MCMC output. It's, pos and it's possible to see that the first part of the chain will introduce bias, especially if the set of samples, samples was small. And also there is a clear correlation between the samples. So it's not an efficient um, representation of our posterior or our target. So what's done traditionally in the literature is to, uh, to kind of tackle these two problems. So bias and, um, and correlation is to estimate a parameter B called Bernin and a parameter T called thinning so that uh, the approximation given to the posterior comes um, basically as a sum of delta function after removing the first B um, samples and uh, basically after picking every teeth sample from the, rem from the remainder of the chain. Uh, now again, removing the first B samples can tackle bias, but it does increase variance if this parameter B is large uh, and if we fix the number of samples N. And thinning, uh, it's possible to show that that also increases variance unless we have a fixed computational budget. Um, so what we uh, what we instead want is basically to uh, find a set of indices uh, M uh, much smaller than N again because of this compression idea, and then basically approximate the posterior distribution as the um, as the as the basically using delta functions uh, in points coming from the MCMC output at those indices. And the, the, this set of indices has, um, to, has to be basically such that um, we're minimizing a uh, um, notion of discrepancy basically between uh, the empirical distribution that is obtained in this way and the target distribution PM. So there are two steps to specify in this method, and they involve uh, deciding what discrepancy to use. And this has to be something that we can compute, but it also has um, interesting properties, so it's meaningful. And we also need to specify how to solve the optimization procedure because it's a combinatorial problem. Um, so uh, what we came up is this algorithm called stand thinning, and this is just a bit of uh, advertising. So we have a web page uh, with code available in Python and MATLAB and also an archived paper. But basically, as I said, we need to specify those two steps. So first step, uh, we need to choose a discrepancy. And so what's um, kind of meaningful to do is to start with a notion of integral probability metric uh, based on a class of test functions F. Uh, that is measure determining. So we say that um, basically the metric that we're considering between um, our empirical distribution and the target, uh, it's basically computed as the supremum uh, over um, test functions between expectations basically uh, of these functions with respect to the empirical distribution and the target. And so we want to, basically this, this, this function is also called witness function. So we want to pick the worst, um, uh, the, the kind of largest difference that we can have among these test functions. And then um, if, we, if we manage to, um, basically uh, integral probability metrics have the properties that if uh, they are zero, if uh, over, a, over an accordingly chosen, um, class of test functions F, then uh, the empirical distribution 
is equal to the target. Uh, there are two main pro two problems with these definitions. And the first one is that uh, the supremum uh, is ideally computed over uh, a class of functions. So it's, it's actually not possible to compute this analytically. And the second one is we don't have, um, we don't, we can compute these integrals. So we don't have a uh, full expression for P and we, we can compute integrals against uh, our target. So the solution to these um, two problems comes from the freedom that we have uh, in choosing the class of functions F. So it's possible to show that um, if we choose F to be um, the unit ball of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and again, I can give more details of this, but hopefully Lester will also talk a bit more about that. Um, so if we, choose, um, if we choose F to be the unit ball of an RKHS, it's possible to get rid of this supremum um, using the kernel trick for, uh, for mini embeddings, basically. Uh, and so we end up with what's called maximum discrepancy. And if we separately um, choose the class of test functions to depend on uh, the distribution on our target P, such that this integral is zero, then we um, end up with what's, what, what's called basically the stand discrepancy. And if we combine these two actions together, uh, we solve our two problems, if you want, and we end up with the notion of kernel stand discrepancy. Um, which uh, can be computed in this way. So it's basically the sum of uh, entries of a gram matrix. Um, so it's a kernel that depends on our um, target distribution P evaluated in all the points that we are keeping in our set, in our point set basically. And it's possible, again, I'm not giving the expression of this KP here, but it's possible to show that it depends on evaluation of the gradient of the log, log um, target density, so this doesn't require any normalizing constants now, and it also depends on a base kernel. Uh, so it's possible also to show that um, under certain conditions, so the first property, the first part basically says we can compute this, this discrepancy uh, if we have gradients of the log target. Second property um, says uh, under certain conditions, this quantity is also convergence determining. So if uh, the KSD goes to zero, then we have weak convergence of the um, empirical distribution to the target. Um, and there's, again, certain conditions that involve, among, among others, the choice of the base kernel to be uh, the inverse multi-quadric kernel with hyperparameter gamma. Um, and so that, that basically means it makes sense to normalize this KSD. Um, it makes sense, it's a, it's a meaningful quantity to minimize. And so the second step is how, how do we do that? Uh, and the simple, um, so there are a number of um, algorithms in the literature, but this simple one that was proved to be, um, to be well performing uh, is um, greedy minimization of the KSD, which means um, given, an set of, uh, given an MCMC output and a kernel KP, uh, we choose this set of indices so that each, each iteration of this algorithm, we're picking uh, the point out of the MCMC output that is minimizing the KSD of the empirical distribution once that point is added to the set of previous points and the target. So it's a greedy, it's a greedy method. Um, it's possible to show that this method has um, cost upper bounded by n times m squared. And so when we fix the number of points m that we want to extract from the MCMC output, that's comparable to the cost of obtaining the MCMC output. And actually in our experiment, this was much smaller than the cost of ob obtaining the MCMC output. Uh, and it's also possible to see that um, this method could select more than, once, more than one time the same point, kind of creating a sort of weighted measure um, if that's the point that's, that's minimizing the KSD. Um, I will just mention briefly that um, there are further developments uh, of this algorithm that involve um, basically mini batching the MCMC output so to improve the speed of, of the whole method. So if, if we have a very long MCMC output as we had mm -hmm. in the cardiac example with 4 million points, it's, uh, it takes time to, to scan all of them. Um, and another development involves uh, basically selecting instead of one point at a time, um, S point at a time. So that that's ideally going to improve even further the optimization um, that's, that's given by this, um, by this optimization. Um, and so that's, those are basically two steps. So choice of KSD and greedy minimization. 
combine give our stand tuning method. Um, I will briefly show theoretical results uh, and then hopefully, um, uh, again, if you, if you have a question, just stop me. So the, the theoretical results that we talk about um, are three. So the first one um, is basically um, a result, a step that is intermediate in the proof of your theorems. And um, it's basically uh, showing that once we use the grid optimization of KSD with fixed MCMC output, uh, we obtain a method that is um, optimal in a, in a sense that, I, that I will show. Um, and then the second two results tackle uh, the fact that actually MCMC output is random. So we have a set of random variables um, and it's not fixed. And we uh, and the third result tackles uh, the fact that there is possible bias in the, in the Markov chain. So for example, bias coming from the fact that the solver was breaking, as I said earlier, um, as, I, as, as I was saying earlier. So um, first result, um, so convergence uh, of the uh, KSD for a fixed MCMC output. So as the number of points goes to infinity. So it's possible to show that the KSD squared uh, of the, basically of points selected greedily from a fixed set of points and the target is upper bounded by the KSD of an optimally weighted um, empirical distribution and the target plus the term that is vanishing as n goes to infinity. So what this says is even if we uh, give uniform weights to the point, uh, as we increase the number of points, basically, um, uh, we're still, um, what's possible to show is basically that the KSD converges to the, to the, of the uniformly weighted uh, measure converges to the KSD of the optimal measure. Um, that, however, has higher cost to produce. So finding these optimal weights has uh, order of n cube cost. Um, so in a picture, um, what I'm showing here is with respect to that cartoon pic, uh, plot that I had at the beginning of, uh, of this um, section, um, the KSD of the kind of um, plain tinned MCMC output. So if we're not doing anything optimally, uh, the KSD uh, of the um, Stein team MCMC output, and which is the black curve, and then the red curve is the KSD of um, this optimally weighted uh, MCMC output, and um, the, black curve, the blue curve was if we remove basically the positivity constraint on the weights, but just ignore that here. So basically, um, it's possible to see that um, as n goes to infinity, um, the, the black curve is doing as good as the red curve. Um, and so this is for fixed MCMC output. And then if we actually consider the fact that we have a release, that we have a Markov chain to start with. So we have a, a P invariant and homogeneous uh, reversible Markov chain that needs to be generated using um, a V uniform ergodic transition kernel. So this is um, basically the kind of main strong assumption of the, on the method. There are a number of other technical assumptions, but this is, this is kind of the main one and it's similar to definition of um, ergodic, um, of ergodicity in MCMC. Um, but we have a, basically this kind of connoted V because we're relating the function that's, that's being used in the uh, definition of ge geometric ergodicity, I wanted to say. We have this function V that is related the, Kind of transition kernel to the in the MCMC to the kernel used in this kernel and discrepancy. But basically, under a certain number of assumptions, um, what happens is that um, we have that the uh, expected KSD squared um, converges to zero, it's basically uh, upper bounded by some terms that are vanishing as m and n go to infinity. And now we have this expectation because again, if the MCMC output is random, this quantity is a random variable. So we basically have L2 convergence of the KSD and also um, basically a finite bound if we fix um, M and N with this result. And finally, third result is if we have a Markov chain that's not targeting P, but it's targeting Q, so another distribution. So it's a potentially biased Markov chain um, it's targeting Q. And then under similar, such that P, P is absolutely continuous with respect to Q. So Q doesn't place zero mass where P is positive, basically. Um, 
so uh, under under conditions similar to to the previous theorem, uh, it's possible to show uh, that we actually have a stronger notion of convergence for the KSD, which is almost sure convergence. The KSD between a Gaudi empirical distribution um, in the random MCMC output and P. Um, and furthermore, that implies that we, we have um, a weak convergence basically of the empirical distribution to P. And again, given that this is now random quantity, it's necessary to specify in which sense that converges, which is almost surely. Uh, but basically this says, um, it makes sense again to, um, to, to optimize the KSD on the, on the MCMC output. So it's a consistent, it's a consistent result. Um, so given, given basically uh, this theoretical part, um, I'm going to show the empirical results that we had on the um, on, on our um, set of um, so, sort of kind of cardiac ODEs, but also some toy ODEs. So what we did was to produce um, MCMC outputs uh, using random walk metropolis Hastings, uh, and we compared um, so traditional thinning as I was showing before. So using finding a parameter um, a burning and the thinning parameter. Um, and then support points, which is um, a competitive method with respect to this, but it doesn't have um, so strong convergence guarantees once it's basically found from the, once it's constructed from, from an MCMC output. And um, stein thinning based on three different choices of that hyperparameter gamma that we had uh, in the base kernel. And so basically this has to be something that is on the scale of the data. Um, and so we, we, we use basically heuristics that are used in, in kernel literature. Um, and we compared, we had two performance measures. So energy distance, which is something similar to what's optimized by the support points method and um, KSD uh, based on one of the settings for gamma. And so I will first show, as I said, a kind of um, toy example. So it's again um, a set of ODE describing protein interaction that has um, um, lower dimensional parameters, so <laughs> lower than 38 dimensional parameters, so it's a four dimensional parameter. Um, and we also uh, set the level of noise to be fairly large. So um, again, the likelihood is not informative and the posterior is not too big to multimodal. Um, so what we, what we did was to, um, as I said, run MCMC, and here I'm showing the trace plots on a log scale. So as, this, as I was saying uh, earlier, it's kind of clear to see that these do look like kind of fat caterpillar once we discard the burning part of the Markov chains. Um, and then we computed, um, so R hat is the kind of traditional convergence diagnostic that is used to, um, um, to decide when the chains have um, reached uh, the target distribution, although it's just um, uh, it's just a, su a sufficient condition, it's not a necessary condition. So um, there, are, there are no guarantees as well here, but it's it's one of the traditional methods to find basically this B hat parameter, um, and it's possible to see uh, that this. Uh, convergence diagnostics suffers from um, the fact that we're fixing the number of points to be to, to a certain value. So in particular, it's possible to see that um, the different lines, the black, blue, and red lines are different methods in the literature for computing this R hat. But it's possible to see that uh, they leave a small portion, either no or a small portion of points um, after uh, after basically being thresholded. And so they leave a small part of the, of the Markov chain to be used when, well, when that's actually not reflected in the data and we could actually pick uh, points even before then. Um, and so what will happen is basically if we compute the estimators from, the, um, from, from our post-process MCMC output, those will be suboptimal. Sub they will have large variance. Um, so what I'm showing here is a point set obtained from the different methods. So standard thinning, uh, finding using different um, B heads, um, support points, and then the three different stand thinning. And again, um, this is to show that, I mean, th this is just a picture of basically what post-processing means, but it's kind of difficult to see um, here because actually the distribution is four dimensional. So we're showing projections. 
uh, but it's mainly to show that, um, oops, sorry, stunting is actually able to discard the whole uh, burning part automatically, but then it's kind of difficult to see which method is doing better than the other one that's by looking at these plots, again, because it's a um, four dimensional distribution actually. So what we did was to look at the two different performance metrics, so energy distance and Kernes discrepancy. And it's possible to show to see that. Um, so again, the black line and gray black line is support points. Uh, gray lines is traditional thinning, and then colored lines is standard. It's stein thinning. Um, what's possible to see is that with respect to both metrics, um, stein thinning uh, is comparable, or uh, or um, or it under or, or it uh, overperforms basically the traditional methods. And this happens again, even with a um, kind of performance metric that is not the one that is directly optimized by, by stein thinning, which is the energy distance. And that in any case doesn't provide convergence control as the case there. Um, so finally, to, to conclude, um, I will show results in the cardiac model that, we, that I was talking about at the beginning. So imagine again, here I'm showing just what's happening for three parameters, but in the paper we have the set of experiments for the all 38 parameters. So uh, what I'm showing here is in the um, rightmost column is MCMC runs um, using two different seeds uh, compared to the prior. And so it's possible to see that MCMC, that, uh, other than suffering the kind of bias coming from the solver breaking, it's also usually uh, getting stuck in different modes. So it has not properly converged. And so what's possible to do with our method is actually to run um, uh, MCMC that is targeting a different distribution. So our distribution Q in the third theorem, um, which is um, a distribution Q in the, in the theorem, which is a tempered version of the posterior. So it's a target distribution that is um, easier to, to sample from, uh, but then we can correct basically for the bias that's coming from the from the fact that that's not our initial target by using stein thinning and so using this post-processing. And so what I'm showing here with this set of um, kind of nine boxes is that we, first of all, have learned something because the posterior is not the same as the prior. And I'm also showing there is a consistency um, using different seeds and also different post-processing methods. Um, oops. So what is the question? Um, okay, so um, what I'm showing here, yeah, so this is, this is the last result for, um, slide is basically our um, performance metric, which is the Kernes discrepancy. Now it's not possible to compute the energy distance anymore because we don't have a reliable um, MCMC output that's needed to compute that, that, that performance metric. Um, but what I'm showing is basically uh, KSD, um, that's, um, um, in which I'm comparing basically stentin MCMC output and uh, kind of um, support points obtained either from um, the original MCMC output uh, or a tempered version of the MCMC output. And so what happens is that um, you targeting a tempered posterior and stand thinning that gives smaller values of, of KSD for two reasons. So if we look at the um, uh, basically gray curve. So that's um, stein, uh, that support points based on um, the tempered MCMC output. We achieve uh, a smaller value because we're debiasing by stein thinning basically. Uh, while if we compute a support points on the initial MCMC output, we achieve a smaller value with stein thinning because uh, this one suffers from the fact that the MCMC has not converged to a stock in those local modes. Um, and so uh, to sum up, um, so I presented a method to um, optimally post-process uh, MCMC output, not just for a, not just for ODs, but really any, any MCMC output. So we were driven by our differential equation uh, application here, but uh, in general, it's an MCMC. Um, and so I showed how um, it's possible to use this post-processing to identify and remove uh, the burning period. And also to perform um, bias removal for a bias sampling procedure. So when we're targeting a different distribution than our original basically target, and hence provide uh, improved approximation on the target. And also um, we're also able to achieve compression of the, of the output. And so then 
in, in our setting use that then to kind of solve um, solve basically simulations of the whole heart. Um, some uh, pro some problems and some things to keep into consideration is uh, we do require that the NCMC, I mean, basically the conditions the conditions in the TRM say that the NCMC needs to have explored um, regions of high probability under the original target. Um, we do require gradients of the log density. Um, and this might be expensive to compute, but the good thing is that once the output has been obtained, this can be computed in parallel. Um, and then a case D is subject to pathology if the target distribution has probability regions in very distant um, part of the parameter space and if uh, the parameter space is high dimensional. So these are some things to, to keep in mind and to kind of, uh, this is their point for, uh, for further uh, consideration and further um, further studies. So uh, with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, hopefully it was under uh, the 15 minutes time and um, ask you if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was exactly on time. Are, is there any question before we go into a quick break? Okay, I want to I want to say thank you so much. And I was, you know, I, I even undersold this. Indeed, it's like not just for MCMC, but really it can be applied to any anything that's outputting like a set of states, basically. Any set of state, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we I mean we have theorems and again uh, together with lesser increase really, but we have theorems for uh, for MCMC, but uh, the main idea is also to um kind of use this threat one of the next steps would be to use this method kind of out of the MCMC box as well. So for example, again, going back to the cardiac application, um, it's very common for, um, it's very common to make use of emulators and those produce gradients of, uh, of a target. Is that it's just not, doesn't have these convergence properties that MCMC has. So for example, it would be useful to, to see how, if and how this, this method is usable or extensions can be, can be uh, applied to use it, so yeah. So in today's talk, I'd like to explain how this somewhat obscure tool from probability theory called the Stein's method can be used to solve a variety of practical problems in um, probabilistic inference and learning. And so the motivation for this talk comes from large scale posterior inference, large scale Bayesian inference. And to give you an example of what I mean by that, I wanna just consider the standard problem of logistic regression. So we have a data set and we have a classification problem. We have <clears throat> d-dimensional feature vectors. We have feature vectors, we'll call them VL. We have L data points. And each feature vector has a binary class label that we'd like to predict. And we're going to relate the feature vector to the class label um, using an unknown parameter vector. We'll call that beta. You know, standard model is a probability um, of the class label being one determined by logistic function applied to the interaction between beta and your features. Okay. now. Um, now, if you take the standard model and you place a prior on the unknown parameters beta, you get what's called Bayesian logistic regression. And what I want to highlight about this model is that the generative model is pretty simple to express. Your betas come from some distribution. Um, you use that to generate your class labels. And now I want to learn about beta. But even in the simple model, the posterior distribution over the unknown parameters beta is already complex. So we already don't know the normalizing constant of the distribution. And that means <clears throat> exact integration is intractable. So computing expectations on this distribution is already difficult. So what do you normally do in this situation? Well, I would say that probably like the standard inferential approach is to use Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC, exactly what Marina was telling us about. And this lets you draw um, a sequence of sample points that eventually are going to converge to the distribution. So like asymptotically, they're giving you an exact approximation to the expectations that you don't know. So I'd like to compute an expectation under this distribution P um, the, that is a posterior distribution. That's some complicated integral, I don't know that, but I can just compute the sample average over my Markov chain Monte Carlo sample, and that eventually was gonna to converge to the right expectation. So that's good, that's the benefit. That's why people use MCMC. But what's the downside? Well, the problem these days with using MCMC is that it's not that scalable. If you have a large data set, then drawing every new point from your Markov chain requires touching every single data point in your data set. And so that's expensive if your data set is large. So um, what can you do about that? 
And in particular, how do you scale MCMC posterior inference to massive data sets? Well, over the past decade, this template solution has been emerging. You might call it approximate MCMC with subset posteriors. And the idea is you take your standard Markov chain and then you approximate it in some way that's cheaper. So instead of looking at all of your data, you just draw a random subset of your data and you look at the posterior in induced by that subset and you use that to draw um, the next sample point. And each time you use a different um, mini batch of your data. And the point here, the, 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 the reasoning behind this is that you can reduce the computational overhead of your sampling. That means you can sample more points. That means you're gonna reduce the Monte Carlo variance of your estimates, those, those sample averages that we we're just discussing in blue. But there's also a cost. And the cost is that you now have this asymptotic bias that is, even if you run this approximate Markov chain forever, you're never going to converge to your target distribution. It's no longer the stationary distribution of your chain. But the hope is that for the fixed amount of sampling time that you have in practice, the reduction in variance can actually outweigh the bias that's introduced. Hi, Lester. Yeah. Uh, this is great. Sorry, I'm not on video. Um, my name is Alex. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the bias? Uh, it, it just... Um... Why is there a bias to using subsets of the data? Why does that bias the result? I, maybe I'm missing something, sorry. There, there are various reasons. So uh, you know, common, a common approach in Markov chain Monte Carlo is that you make some sort of proposal and then you correct that proposal using what's called like Metropolis-Hastings correction. But Metropolis-Hastings correction are, are expensive. The correction itself requires you again to touch your entire data set to ensure that you're actually converging to the right distribution. And that's like that's that actually is the fundamental thing. Just checking or ensuring that your, your Markov chain is converging to the right distribution requires you to touch all of the data on each sample point. And so most of these approximate MCMC approaches will make a proposal and then they won't correct it because the correction is too expensive. They'll just hope that the proposal is just good enough, it's pretty good, and just keep going. And okay. that's how that's spirit. <laughs> But so, so how does that square with this, this like naive intuition that, that if the data are IID, then everything's ergodic and, and whether you use subsets or the whole thing, eventually you'll converge to the right thing. Is that, is that wrong? That's often wrong. That there are a few special cases where you'll just converge to the right thing anyway, but in almost every other case, it's wrong. There's some sort of bias. But often that, but the nice thing is that often that bias is controllable, it's tunable. You know, okay. you'll have, depending on how big the subset is on each round, um, you can quantify the amount of bias that's being introduced into your approximation. In fact, that's kind of what this talk is about. Right, it's and is that true quantified. even for IID data? That's true even for IID data, yeah. So all okay. of this is assuming most of it, well, I haven't assumed really anything yet, but um, even for just standard IID data, even for that Bayesian logistic regression example, you're getting huh. IID data, Gaussian priors in your betas. If you just use subsets in every round and you ran, for instance, so like, you know, a typical algorithm is called, um, um, uh, the unadjusted Langevin algorithm. That's like you use a, you know, you take a gradient step and you add Gaussian noise and that's your proposal. Um, even that actually is without a correction that doesn't go converge to the right thing either. And then if you, on top of that, you do subsampling, then you get this additional bias. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. All right, so that's a great question. And, you know, I actually think this is a promising way to get to scale up MCMC but also raises a lot of challenges, a lot of questions like the question that was just asked. You know, for instance, how do, we, how do we know how good our approximate MCMC procedure is? And how do we compare the samples that we're getting out of different approximate MCMC procedures? And then um, typically there's some tuning parameters you have to set. For instance, you know, how big can I make this mini batch size if I'm subsampling my data? How, you know, what sort of step sizes do I need? Every MCMC algorithm I've encountered has tuning parameters. How do you set them given that um, we don't even know if this is converging to the right distribution. And then finally, how do we quantify that bias variance trade off explicitly so that we know what we're getting in the end so we can trust the results of our um, posterior inference? So you might be aware that there are many standard evaluation criteria for MCMC algorithms, like effective sample size, trace plots, variance diagnostics, but they all assume eventual convergence to the target distribution, and they don't account for this asymptotic bias. They're all essentially just measures of variance, and they tell you how correlated your sample points are, but they're assuming that eventually you're sampling from the right thing. So this talk is going to be about new quality measures that are suitable for comparing the quality of these approximate MCMC samples. 
And a bit more generally, um, we'd like to develop measures that are suitable for comparing the quality of any two sample approximations that are targeting the same distribution. So here's, here's, this is going to be the setup for the talk. So we're going to focus on continuous target distributions on R to the D, um, but you could relax that to a distribution supported on any convex set. And we're going to assume the dark distribution has a, a density, a little p. And we know that p up to a normalization constant, but typically this, that knowledge is, means that integration under p is still intractable. So we're going to approximate integration with a sample. So someone's going to hand me sample points, x1 through xn. I'm going to use sample averages to approximate complicated integrals under my target. And at this point, I'm actually not, at this point, and actually at, I guess not at any point in the talk, I'm not going to make any particular assumption about the sample points. So they could be coming from MCMC or approximate MCMC. They could be becoming IID um, from your target distribution. They could be some sort of de deterministic quadrature rule. We're not going to assume anything about the provenance, but we still want to quantify how well does my sample approximation approximate my target expectation? Okay, and we have some criteria, we have some desiderata here. So we wanna do this in a way where we can detect if your sample sequence is actually converging to your target distribution. And we also wanna detect if your sample sequence is not converging to your target distribution. And we wanna do this all in a way where it's all computationally feasible. So you can go off and use this whenever you're running, say approximate MCMC. Okay, so given those criteria, I think a, a natural starting point is what's called an integral probability metric. And this is just a way of measuring the maximum discrepancy between sample and target expectations over a large class of test functions. And so a lot of standard metrics that you, you may have heard of before fall into this class. So Wasserstein distances, bounded Lipschitz distances, even total variation um, all fall into this class of probability metrics. And the nice thing about an, inter an, an integral problem, I'll say IPM for short, it's, long, it's hard to say this over and over again. And the nice thing about an IPM is that when your test function class is sufficiently large, then the convergence of your IPM to zero means that your sample sequence is converging to P. So that's good. That means that we can, we can tell if something is, um, we can detect non-convergence in particular. Um, but the problem with an IPM, with the, with the standard IPMs that I just mentioned, is that the definition of an IPM involves integration under P, and that's exactly what we don't know how to do. And so remember, we were trying to compute these things, but computing an, an IPM is typically intractable for the same reason that computing expectations under P is intractable. We just don't know how to do it. So how can we get around that? Well, one idea is that we, can on we could only consider test functions that are known a priori to have mean zero under your target distribution. If we could do that, then we get rid of this expectation under P and the resulting quality measure only depends on the samples. So this is something that we could potentially compute. But then you might ask like, well, how do we find test functions that are mean zero under P? That's a good question. And then if you did find them, will the resulting discrepancy measure actually track convergence in the way that we want? That's an important question. And then still, even if we get rid of integration under P, we still have this infinite dimensional optimization problem that we have to solve just to compute the quality measure. So how do we do that? So I'm gonna come back to that third question a bit later, but at first I wanna spend some time discussing the first two questions and showing you how Stein's method can give us a, a handle on answers to those questions. So in my view of Stein's method, um, uh, which was developed in the, in the 60s and 70s, is that it provides uh, a recipe for controlling convergence. And it's a, you can say, I think of it as like a three-step recipe. So the first step is to find an operator that generates mean zero functions under your target distribution P. So I'm gonna call the operator T. It's gonna take as input functions that belong to a set G. And it's just gonna spit out other functions that are mean zero. This is great because this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to find a way of picking, of finding mean zero functions. This is going to be the way. And I'm not going to say what the operator is yet. I'll, I'll pick one in the next slide, but let's just see what we do. Once we have that operator in that set, what is that by us? All right, well, if you have your operator T and you have its, if its domain G, you can define what I'll call a Stein discrepancy, which is an IPM type measure that doesn't have any explicit integration under P because all the functions are mean zero under P. So you don't have to worry about that part. So now it's just a function of the, the sample 
Okay. The second step in Stein's method is typically to lower bound the Stein discrepancy by some sort of reference IPM that you already know and trust. So this could be like your Wasserstein distance, for instance, that's you're familiar with. And this means that if your Stein discrepancy goes to zero, then your Wasserstein distance also goes to zero, which means that you know your sample is converging. This lets us, to, this lets us um, fulfill our second requirement of detecting non-convergence. And typically this step requires analysis. You have to um, prove that this is true for some class of distributions. But you can often do it once in advance for large classes of distributions, and then you can go off and use your Stein discrepancy knowing that it has this property. The third step in Stein's method is typically to upper bound the Stein discrepancy by any means necessary to demonstrate that it actually does go to zero under reasonable conditions. So for instance, that if your sample is going to be, then your Stein discrepancy goes to zero. Now this is the least important step for us because in practice, you're just going to compute the Stein discrepancy and you can see the value, but it's still nice to know that you have this property. So I'm gonna show you some results about that too. So this is this this operator T, if, if we're just familiar with Stein in the case of the normal distribution, that is that that uh, you know G G prime minus X G of X or something? Is that exactly that's exactly right. So like that's taking in the function G and it's outputting, as you said, like G prime minus X times G. And that's a, a great example of an operator, and it's gonna be a, a special case of the operator that we'll talk about in this talk. Great. Are you gonna talk through examples or, or should we just take your word for this? Uh, I'll give you, yeah, so I'm gonna give you some examples. So, so far, this is all abstract. On the yeah. next slide, we'll do some examples. Wonderful, okay, thanks. This is, yeah. this is a cool way to set it up. Thank you. I'm glad you're following it. Um, so I should just say the standard use for this recipe is as an analytical tool. So Stein originally developed Stein's method to prove the central limit theorem and to give a rate of convergence to the central limit theorem. So that's the, the classical use in probability theory is for that reason. Um, but our goal is going to be to develop it into a practical quality measure that you can compute and use for say MCMC assessment. So uh, you know, as we just said, this is all pretty abstract. Uh, I'll try to give you next a specific instantiation of all of these quantities so we can see how we can use it in practice. So first I mentioned we need this operator T and we need something that will generate mean zero functions under our target. Where are we gonna get that from? Well, we're gonna build on this beautiful idea due to Andrew Barbour called the generator method. And the idea is that if you could identify a Markov process that has P as its stationary distribution, then there's this quantity associated with the process called a generator that under mild conditions generates mean zero functions. It just has this property, it's very nice, very convenient. And I've given you the definition of that a generator here, but we don't need it. We won't have to worry about that. We're only gonna look at one, one Markov process, one generator. This is the process, it's called the overdamped Langevin diffusion. Um, you can define it for any target distribution with a differentiable density. And here's the generator, and here's the operator that we're going to pull out of that generator. Um, we're gonna call it, uh, so we'll call this a Stein operator in homage to Stein. Um, this is its form, it takes in a, a vector value function G, it outputs this. What I want you to take away about this operator is that it depends on P only through the gradient of its log density. And that's nice because that's computable even if P can't be normalized. So even if you don't know the normalizing constant, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's not involved in computing this operator. And um, going back to the question that just came up, you can think of this as a multivariate generalization of the density method operator in Stein's method. So Stein's method originally was just about the normal distribution and people have generalized it in various different ways. In the, in the case of a normal distribution, this operator is just G of X times minus X plus G prime of X. That was exactly the operator that um, I was just mentioned a few minutes ago. More generally, you can replace that minus X with the derivative of the log density in one dimension. And what we'll be working with is a multivariate generalization of that. So, so, it, so in that case, it's that the normal distribution is the stationary measure of the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck diffusion, I guess? Is that, exactly. is that where this comes from? Exactly. So the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck is a special case of the Langevin diffusion in the case yeah. of the normal. Um, that's right. And so Stein didn't derive it in that way. He had his other, a different way of deriving right. it. But if you go back and you say, oh, okay, well, if we take this perspective of a Markov process, take the ornstein uhlenbeck process, find its generator, it will give you back Stein's operator. And, that, but also that, let you generalize its other distributions. That's so cool. Like to connect Stein to the heat equation in such a direct way. I, that, I, okay. I didn't realize there was a formal way to do that. All right. Yeah. I think that's super cool too. <laughs> And so, yeah, that connection really, that, uh, that connection of, you know, taking a Markov process really comes from Barbour, 
and he used that to, to study, you know, multivariate, um, uh, basically multivariate normal distributions. And here we're trying to extend it to other distributions that you might encounter in posterior inference. All right, so we've got our operator, that's great. I mentioned that you also need a domain uh, on which you can apply your operator. And so in our case, we're gonna pick um, what I'll call classical sign set. So if you take every, any function that's bounded, has bounded derivatives and have bounded second derivatives, then you're guaranteed that if you pass it through the Stein operator that I just gave you, the output is going to be mean zero. So that's sufficient to get the guarantees that we want. So we're gonna use this classical Stein set, bounded functions with bounded derivatives and bounded second derivatives. Okay, so if you take our Stein operator T and you combine it with a Stein set G, you get back a Stein discrepancy. Let's call that a classical Stein discrepancy. And so now we have something, I've made a choice. And the question is, does it detect convergence and non-convergence in the way that we want? And it actually turns out that most of the work in Stein's method has focused on uni univariate targets. And there are lots of results in the literature that basically say the Stein discrepancy goes to zero if and only if the Wasserstein distance goes to zero, which is exactly the sort of result we want. That means we can, control, we can detect convergence, we can detect non-convergence just by looking at the Stein discrepancy. But very few multivariate targets have been analyzed, except for the multivariate Gaussian, which comes up because of central limit theorems again. So um, one con contribution um, that my collaborators and I made was to provide this result, which basically says that if your target distribution belongs to a certain class, then your Stein discrepancy goes to zero if and only if the Wasserstein distance goes to zero. What is that class? It's the class of distributions for which the Langevin diffusion um, mixes quickly. What are those distributions? So that's any strongly log concave distribution that includes the Bayesian logistic regression example that I gave you at the beginning that has a Gaussian prior, but it also covers other distributions like Gaussian mixtures. So you can cover some multimodal distributions, um, even distributions that um, are uh, not log concave like uh, students T regression with Gaussian priors. So, you know, I'll give you more, you can find more details about, you know, what exactly what distributions are covered in our paper. But I do want to highlight that the conditions of this theorem are not necessary. So we're hoping that this sort of theorem will provide a template for other people targeting other distributions to establish similar results that apply to their targets. So this is much stronger than this is answering the weak convergence question, but but in a much stronger way because because instead of just weak convergence, you have something quantitative with Wasserstein, or is it? That's the, yeah, so that's right. So first, it is about Wasserstein, which actually turns out to be like a more natural metric for the Stein discrepancy um, for some technical reasons. And, and I've only told you like, you know, I've only said something asymptotic it goes to zero if and only if it goes to zero, but really in our paper, we have upper and lower bounds that are explicit. So you can upper and lower bound the Wasserstein distance by the Stein discrepancy. Okay, and I was gonna ask which Wasserstein, and it seems that you have the same norm in the Wasserstein as you have like in G. And what, what does that mean? What's going on there? Yeah, so the norm, I would say it doesn't matter all that much and all of the examples will be using the two norm and the L2 norm. Technically, you can use any norm you want. So if you have a favorite norm that's appropriate for your, your target functions, that makes you could use that. Okay. Um, and it appears, it appears in, the G, in the Stein discrepancy because I said that the functions are bounded and have bounded derivatives, and you have to bound them in some norm. Oh, OK. I use them. But it's not that important. My favorite and, norm is the two norm. Your favorite norm. Two norm is great. And um, for the Wasserstein distance, it's the, one, it's the L1 Wasserstein distance. Um, oh. specifically, oh. which means like you're taking the expectation of like the norm as opposed to like the expectation of the norm squared. Okay, thanks. All right, all right, so this is great. And it also turns out that a variant of this classical Stein discrepancy can be computed. You can, can compute it by solving a linear program. Um, that we got the details of that also in the same paper and we have software out there that does that for you. So let me show you what um, it looks like in action. So first, I just want to give you the simplest possible example, just so you can understand some basic properties of using a Stein discrepancy. So in this example, I'm going to draw two sample sequences. One sample sequence, I'm going to draw IID from the target distribution. The target is just going to be a standard normal. All right, that's our P. And the other sample sequence, I'm going to draw IID not from the target distribution, from something else. Specifically, it's a student's T distribution that has the same mean invariance, scaled to have the same mean invariance. But that doesn't matter that much. It's just something else that's not P. OK. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the Stein discrepancy 
as I get more and more points. So every time I add another point, I'm going to recompute this time discrepancy with a full set of sample points that I've, I've sampled so far. And what do you see? You see in this red curve that as I sample more and more points from the target distribution, the Stein discrepancy goes to zero at like a one over square root n rate, which is like what you would expect in this case. So it's going to zero. We're converging. Life is good. That's what you expect. Meanwhile, if I sample IID from not P, from the student's T distribution, you know, it decreases for the Stein discrepancy decreases for a bit, but eventually bottoms out. It bottoms out because you're, you're not getting a better approximation to your target distribution by sampling more from the wrong distribution. And this is essentially the way that you want to use a sign discrepancy. You have these different samples. And you want to say, what is offering a better approximation? And if you sample enough from the target, then eventually you're getting a better approximation than sampling from something else. Now, one thing, so the, the main thing you get, I would say you get back from the sign discrepancy is the value, you know, the number that I'm plotting on this plot. But you can also recover the function, that test function that, um, that um, led to the worst case discrepancy. And that can be interesting too. So the test, remember we're passing these test functions G through our operator. So this is, a, this is the worst case G that led to that, like the biggest value of your discrepancy. More interpretable than that is the function passed through the operator T because this is the function that should have been mean zero under your target that is most not mean zero that has a mean farthest from zero under your sample. And so this lets you, you know, diagnose a few things. So for instance, I said we're sampling from a student's t. So student's t is a heavier tail distribution than a Gaussian. And if you look at these large sample values, if you look at the function that, um, that leads to the, you know, the worst case violation and uh, the biggest discrepancy, you see that it has a lot of mass in its tails. So this is saying that the way I can tell that this sample is not a normal sample is by looking at the tails. You have like way too many sample points in the tails. And so this function is putting all of its weight there. And this gives you a way of like diagnosing it, like in what way my sample is different from my target. Okay. So here's a more interesting example. That one was just IID sampling. Let's take a, an, an actual example. Let's post go, I'm sorry. Could yeah. you go back and just tell me what the axes are in those, in those plots? Is This is the location and the test function and the test functions are, are, are random from the family or what? So, when you, so when you solve the Stein discrepancy, you're, you're yeah. solving this, there's a, I should go back to the definition of it. So you're taking the supremum over functions G. So you're, yeah. looking at, you're looking at every function in that classical Stein set and you're finding the worst one, the one that leads to the, the biggest discrepancy, the, the, the function that has mean that's farthest from zero. Uh -huh. Because all these functions have means, so TG always has mean zero under P. Right. And so you're looking for the, you know, the sample expectation that's farthest from zero. So I'm okay. actually showing you the function that has the sample expectation farthest from zero. I see. And how did, I mean, in practice, how do you take that supremum? What, what do you actually do? Ah, uh, you solve a linear program. Right. You said that. Great. Okay. Sorry. I'm just trying to connect the pieces. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I've, 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 I've omitted a bunch of details, but in this particular case, or this classical Stein discrepancy or this variant of classical Stein discrepancy, you can solve a linear program. It returns both the value you know, the, you know, the difference from zero and the function that like led to that value. I see, I see. So this, this arg max or arg soup is, is the thing that's, that's telling you where, where in your data set is the problem coming from? That's right, exactly. And then this, this is the function G that you get back, but that's not that interpretable. It's more interpretable if you pass it through the operator because that's the function that should be mean zero and isn't mean zero under your sample. Oh, very nice. Yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Great. All right, so here's a more interesting example. We're going to do some posterior inference now. So what does this mean? That means you have a prior distribution over what's called your parameters. You have a bunch of likelihood terms representing data points that you've drawn, been drawn from your model, and you're interested in the posterior distribution, which is proportional to the product of the prior and your likelihoods. Um, now, a popular algorithm for doing MCMC on posteriors these days is something called stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. And if you're familiar with other MCMC algorithms, um, you can view it as an approximation to the Metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm or the unadjusted Langevin algorithm. It's different in a couple of different ways. Well, let me just actually describe the algorithm. You'll see the differences. So you're going to start with a random point, some, some point in R to the D. And to draw your next point in your Markov chain, you're going to take a gradient step um, in the direction of your gradient, in, in the direction of your densities. You're going to take a grad log P step. And you know, 
determined by your target density. But grad log P is expensive to compute. Why is it expensive? Because it involves summing over each of the data points in your data set. So if you have a big data set, you don't want to do that. What are you going to do instead? Instead of taking a gradient step, you're going to take a stochastic gradient step. You're going to randomly pick a subset of your data points. That we'll call that a mini batch. And you're going to approximate the full gradient with a stochastic gradient. Then you add some Gaussian noise. And that's, that's your next point in your Markov chain. Now, normally when you're doing MCMC, you'd call that your proposal. And of course, your proposal is just something. It doesn't necessarily lead you to the sample from your target distribution. And so what you do is you correct it with Metropolis Hastings. But Metropolis Hastings is expensive. It involves touching all your data points again. So what people do in this algorithm is they just throw away the Metropolis Hastings step, and they're done. So start at a point, add a stochastic gradient, add Gaussian noise. That's your next point. You just keep doing that over and over again. Now, when you don't do this, when you don't do Metropolis Hastings correction, then the step size that you use in this algorithm matters a lot. So first of all, if your step size is very small, then you're not, then you, then people say you, you're mixing slowly, which means you like barely move from your starting point. So here I've taken, I think maybe a thousand points. I've taken a thousand steps, but I haven't really moved from my starting point. Now the contours here are, these contours are the equidensity contours of your target distribution. So you're trying to get a sample that looks like those contours. Now this, this sample clearly does not look like those contours because your step size was too small and you, you barely moved. On the other hand, if you pick your step size too big, then you're gonna you'll move around a lot, but your target, but your sample won't look anything like your target distribution anymore because you're not doing Metropolis Hastings correction. So you're like, you know, you've introduced this approximation, you're taking gradient steps, you no longer look like the target. And so this is the sort of sample you might get from a, an overly large step size. So how would you, so a question might be like, you know, how do you pick a step size? And this is a, a question you always run into when you have to use these algorithms, like how do you pick your step size? A standard thing you would do if this were regular MCMC and not approximate MCMC would be to use effective sample size. So you, you would take a grid of step sizes, you would draw a chain from every one of those step sizes, and then you would assess each of them using a diagnostic like effective sample size. Now, effective sample size is really just a measure of autocorrelation. It's a measure of variance. How, how similar do your points look to one another? And it doesn't account for um, bias at all. And so effective sample size will say, oh, just pick the biggest step size you can. It says, pick this one. This looks great from a variance perspective. But of course, we know that's a really bad approximation. And so instead, we're going to use the Stein discrepancy to do the same thing. We're going to draw our pilot chains. We're going to assess each, each different step size. Here, lower is better for Stein discrepancy. So it says, if your step size is too small, that gives you a bad approximation. If your step size is too large, that gives you a bad approximation. But if you pick something in between, that seems to be giving you the best. This is the one that it ends up picking out. Um, this is the sample that it ends up selecting amongst the different um, step size choices, which amongst the choices, it gives you the best approximation to your target. OK. Um, so I mentioned that, so those plots that I just, I've just shown you are, are using a variant of the classical Stein discrepancy. I mentioned that you can solve that with a linear program, or you can compute it with a linear program. I'm going to give you a second variant of a Stein discrepancy that's just easier to compute. And so I want to spend more time talking about that one. And to do this, all I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out the Stein set that we use. I'm going to use the same operator, but instead of using that classical Stein set, I'm going to give you another Stein set um, that turns out to be more user-friendly. And this is more related to what um, Mar Marina mentioned in her talk. So the approach is going to be based on reproducing kernels. All I want you to know about a kernel is that it's just some function that has two arguments. It's symmetric in those two arguments. And it's called positive semi-definite, which means that if you formed a matrix of kernel evaluations, if you took endpoints and formed a matrix of the pairwise kernel evaluations, that matrix is always a positive semi-definite matrix. But anyway, we have some kernel. You've probably seen some of these kernel functions before. The Gaussian kernel is displayed here. It looks like a Gaussian density. Here's another one called inverse multi-quadric that will come up again, kind of like the Gaussian kernel, except instead of decaying exponentially, it's decaying like a polynomial. And what we need from this kernel is the fact that it actually generates what's called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So that's some function space that we're going to use to construct our Stein set. So here's our Stein set. Instead of using the, you know, all functions that are bounded with bounded derivatives, we're going to say we have a function G. It's a vector valued function, so it's D components. Each component belongs to the RKHS. All the components are bounded in the RKHS norm. 
that's the definition. It doesn't matter that much. What matters actually about um, the Stein set is that it gives rise to a closed form Stein discrepancy, which we'll call kernel Stein discrepancy. So how do you compute this kernel Stein discrepancy? So before we had to solve a linear program to compute the worst case function and compute the value. Now the, we just get the answer. The answer is closed form. How do you get it? Well, you take your original kernel K, you pass it through your Stein operator twice, once for each argument of K, and you get back what you might call a Stein kernel. This is the form of it. This is a compact form of it. There are other ways to write it. This is the best that for fitting on one slide, but you get back a, a new kernel, we'll call it K zero, which is your Stein kernel. Then to compute the kernel Stein discrepancy, you just evaluate the Stein kernel at every pair of sample points. Evaluate at every pair of sample points, sum them all together, that gives you your Stein kernel, that gives you your kernel Stein discrepancy. So what I like about that is that it's very convenient. You don't have to carry a linear program solver around. Also, you can parallelize the computation. You could do that, you know, you have to do it, you have to do n squared evaluations, but you can parallelize that. So that's very easy. And um, and we just do a, we just talk very quickly about what the convergence control properties are of this. So we know we can compute it, but does it actually control convergence? Um, and so remember, the, what do we mean by controlling convergence? We want it to be the case that if your Stein discrepancy goes to zero, then your sample is actually converging to P. That's like the, the most important thing that we want. I'll call that detecting non-convergence. And it turns out that in the univariate case, this happens under pretty mild conditions. If you use whatever kernel you want and you use the same sorts of target distributions that we mentioned before, um, the, you know, the Bayesian logistic regression or the Gaussian mixtures, the ones that have that fast mixing lens of diffusion, if you use the same target distributions and your favorite kernel, things will work out and you can detect, detect non-convergence. But the univariate case for us isn't the most interesting case because typically if you're doing posterior inference, you have more than one parameter. So what about the multivariate case? And it turns out that in the multivariate case, you need to be careful. You can't just throw any kernel into the Stein discrepancy. In particular, the kernels that you might think to use, like a Gaussian kernel, are going to fail. And that's what this result says. I don't want to go into all the details of it. It basically says if you pick a kernel that has very rapidly decaying tails, like a Gaussian or matern kernel, or even one of these IM, these inverse multi-quadric IMQ kernels that have polynomial decay, if your kernel's decaying too quickly, then your Stein discrepancy is not going to detect non-convergence. In fact, you can send the Stein discrepancy to zero with a sequence of points that are not converging to anything. You could just take a bunch of points and put them on a sphere and just shoot them off to infinity, and the Stein discrepancy will go to zero, but you're not converging to P, which is like clearly not what you want. But you can fix that, um, and you can fix that with the right choice of kernel. So I said that if you use one of these IMQ kernels and your decay is too quick, then your, your, your Stein discrepancy is still broken. But if you actually use a slow enough decay, so in particular, if you, if you use an IMQ kernel that's only decaying with the decay rate between 0 and, and 1, then everything works. If your Stein discrepancy goes to 0, then your, then your sample sequence is going to P, which is the property that we want from our, um, our quality measure. OK, and then there's, a revert, there's also the flip question. If my sample is converging to P, will my Stein discrepancy go to 0? I said this is the least important question for us. It is but I'll still say something about it. It turns out that you get this property under pretty weak conditions. So for this property, you can, again, use basically any kernel you want. Um, and then if your Stein discrepancy, and just as we say here, it, your, if your sample is converging to P in Wasserstein distance, then your Stein discrepancy will go to zero. Okay. So let me give you another example of approximate MCMC. This one is called um, stochastic gradient Fisher scoring. It's another variant of the Metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm. Again, it throws away the correction because it's too expensive. It um, only uses a mini batch of sample points for every step to, for scalability. And so because of these changes, your target distribution is not your stationary distribution. And in this initial paper, there are actually two different variants of the algorithm. One, which is meant to be more expensive that inverts um, a matrix on every step, and another that's less expensive because it only inverts a diagonal matrix on every step. And so I want to consider the standard task of just choosing amongst different variants of MCMC algorithms for your problem. That's the sort of problem that comes up for me all the time. I have a bunch of MCMC algorithms. What should I use? 
And so we're going to use, we're going to, I want to target a Bayesian logistic regression posterior, like the example that I gave you at the beginning. So it's a classification problem. This is based on the NIST handwritten digits data set. So we're using 10,000 images. It's going to be a 51 um, dimensional problem because there are 51 features. And we want to essentially distinguish like one digit from another. Okay. So what are we doing here? What am I displaying here? On the left, I'm displaying um, the values of a kernel Stein discrepancy on this problem. And so I'm getting samples from two different samplers. On the top, we have the diagonal version. On the bottom, we have the full version. Remember, the full version is more expensive, the diagonal is less expensive. And what are you seeing from this plot? Basically, you're seeing that like across all the sample sizes that you're interested in, the, the full version seems like it's a lot better than the diagonal version, that, that it's giving you a much better approximation to your posterior. Now, I could just give you that plot, and then you just have to trust me that you know what, whatever this kernel Stein discrepancy says is correct. So I'm going to, on the right, I'm going to give you an external evaluation of the quality of these samples. And to give you this external evaluation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to um, generate a very long um, ground truth surrogate chain. So I'm going to take some MCMC algorithm that we already trust, that we trust converges. I'm going to run it for a very long time, and I'm going to use it as a, as a surrogate for the the intractable target distribution. And then I can compute lots of stuff on that surrogate. And so on the right-hand side, I'm actually computing the ground truth means and covariances for every pair of variables. And I'm comparing them with the um, estimated means and covariances that you get from your Markov chain, from your approximate MCMC algorithms. So on the top, I'm showing in, blue, in red is the ground truth, and blue is like what the um, what your approximate MCMC algorithm estimates for your covariance ellipse. And then since there are lots of pairs, there are 51 dimensions, there are lots of pairs of variables, I'm showing you the best alignment and the worst. And what you're seeing on the top is that even in the best case, the diagonal version of the algorithm is doing a pretty terrible job at approximating covariances. But meanwhile, even in the worst case, the full version is doing a great job at approximating covariances. And this is essentially what we see reflected in this a discrepancy difference on the left. Um, the reason why the diagonal version is so much higher up is because it's just doing a really bad job at approximating your target. And the advantage, but the advantage of computing the Stein discrepancy over the process that I just mentioned is that you don't need that extra external circuit chain to do it. So to do the assessment on the right, I need another MCMC algorithm that I already trust and I know is good to check. And on the left, I don't need that extra algorithm. Okay, so, so far I've been focusing on, you know, comparing samples that have been drawn from different um, approximate inference procedures, but there are other inferential tasks that you can solve with these same tools. And so another that has been studied, you know, it was originally proposed as an application by Chiu Elkowski et al. and Liu et al. is goodness of fit testing. And in goodness of fit testing, you have a sample We'll say it's drawn ID, but it can also be coming from a fast mixing chain. And you want to know, did this was the sample generated from P or not? That's the question. That's the hypothesis testing question that you want to answer. And in their original work, they used a kernel Stein discrepancy with um, a default Gaussian kernel. They used a Gaussian kernel, but we've seen already that the Gaussian kernel has some problems. In particular, in higher dimensions, it doesn't detect non-convergence. You can send it to zero without actually converging to P, it has all sorts of problems. And so in the experiments of these two works, they found that the um, hypothesis testing with a Gaussian kernel broke down in higher dimensions. And so we're going to try to fix it just by using a better kernel. We're going to use the IMQ kernel instead that has these convergence control properties. What happens when you do that? Well, here's the, here's the testing setup. Um, you have a data set. It's basically a draw from a multivariate Gaussian, but there's a spike. It's one of the coordinates is spiked. It's spiked with a uniform variable. So it's actually not a draw from a, a multivariate Gaussian, but you want to test whether it is. So my question is, is it a draw from a, uh, from a, from a multivariate Gaussian? Um, and so you just want to check that it's not. And so there are standard tests for doing this. For multivariate Gaussian in particular, there's are, there are classical tests. One is one um, due to Barenhaus and Henze. Um, and so I'm going to compare the B and H test, the classical test, to the Stein discrepancy test with a Gaussian kernel versus a Stein discrepancy test with an IMQ kernel. And what do you find? We find that in low dimensions, all these tests work really well. They have full power. They can always detect that the sample is not coming from P. But 
the galaxy test in particular breaks down in higher dimensions. And by the time you go up to 25 dimensions, it has no, essentially no power to detect um, the departure from the, tar from the target distribution. Meanwhile, your classical test for Bernal's and Henza is also starting to break down at that point. But if you just swap in a good kernel, a kernel that you know, know controls convergence for the Gaussian kernel, you fix that problem. So you get full power throughout the, you know, the dimension range of the study. Um, another, so I'm just gonna go through a few different uh, potential uh, applications. So another is um, improving sample quality. Um, so, so far we've, we've been just been assessing your sample quality. You, you give me a sample from something, I'm telling you how good it is. You can also imagine using a Stein discrepancy to improve the quality of your sample. That is, you can imagine reweighting all of the points to minimize your Stein discrepancy. And that's exactly what Lou and Lee proposed um, in their black box important sampling paper. So they said, draw a sample, minimize the weights of a Stein discrepancy um, to get a better weighted sampling to get a better approximation. So what happens if you do that? Well, if you just have an IID sample, even an IID sample, if you start with an IID sample from a multivariate Gaussian target, you get this approximation quality for your mean. Um, if you reweight your points using your Stein discrepancy with a Gaussian kernel, you get a basically a uniform improvement across dimensions um, from doing so. And if you use an IMQ kernel instead, you get yet, yet another improvement. So you can get better approximations using these Stein discrepancies. And this is very related to what um, Marina was talking about in her talk. Now you might say, oh, it's, it's good to be able to reweigh points, but maybe it's better to just move your points around. Like maybe I don't just want to change the weights, I want to shift the points around. And so there've been a few proposals in the literature for doing this. One very popular one is called Stein variational gradient descent. It takes points and then put, changes their location on every step using essentially your, your Stein operator um, applied to your kernel. And so it turns out you can view this as um, minimizing the KL divergence between your approximation and your target distribution um, and finding, a, finding a, an update direction that will essentially minimize your KL divergence maximally and has some asymptotic convergence guarantees and it's very simple to implement. But it's also kind of expensive because it takes n squared time to update everything. But that's one approach you can take. A second, that my, some of my collaborators and I have been developing is called Stein points which essentially just greedily minimizes your KSD. So you start with no points, you choose one location that minimizes the, the Stein discrepancy to your target, and then you subsequently add points to improve that, to improve that approximation. Now let's go quickly through this. Here's a difference between what you get from MCMC versus what you get from these Stein point algorithms. You see that with MCMC, because of the randomness, you're getting much more clumping and many more spaces that are not really covered by points. Whereas with Stein points, you tend to fill out space in a more uniform way where the points rep repel one another. I'm going to skip over some of these applications. These are some of the similar, same applications that Marina was discovering to ODEs. Um, and I want to leave you with, so this has just been a, a whirlwind tour of like some of these methods and some of the tasks that you can address with them, but I want to leave you with some, some open questions um, just in case any of those are of interest to you. So I think there are a lot of directions for improving what I've described so far. Uh, one is along the lines of improving scalability while still maintaining convergence control. So there are two places where scalability can come into play. One is, you know, these Stein discrepancies are based on grad log P. But if grad log P is expensive to evaluate, then you don't want to have to evaluate to compute your Stein discrepancy. How can, how can you deal with that? Some of my collaborators and I have been working on what are called stochastic Stein discrepancies, which approximate grad log P in much the same way that you'd approximate an MCMC algorithm. And what you can show is that you still control convergence with probability one when you do this. So you can just draw subsamples of your data instead of evaluating the full gradient. Another potential point of expense is the kernel matrix. So I said you have to evaluate this kernel at every pair of sample points. That's n squared computation. That's an n squared computation. What if that's too much for you? Um, there have been a few different approaches to reduce that. They essentially try to approximate the kernel with a low rank version. And here are a couple of pointers to papers that, to, that deal with that and make it more scalable. And then I mentioned the particular Stein operator that's derived from the Langevin diffusion, but there are an infinite number of operators that characterize, your, that characterize P. So what's the best one? How's your discrepancy impacted? How do we select one? That's still an open question, but my collaborators and I have done some work on this, exploring other alternatives. So I'll just point you to the reference on diffusion Stein operators. And there's much more you can do. You can, train generative models to generate faces of celebrities. 
You can um, um, solve some non-convex optimization problems. Um, and you can also do thinning as, a, as a Marina was describing today. Um, you, have a, you have a good approximation that's too large. Can, can you compress it into a much smaller approximation that still gives you a high quality, um, that still gives you a high quality approximation to your target so you can do expensive downstream tax on that smaller representation. And so let's leave you with a slide so we'll maybe stimulate some discussion. Thank you. Lester, thank you so much. Can I open it up to questions? If there isn't, if there isn't a more immediate question, I guess I'd love to know what research you're focusing on right now, like what you're doing. Mr. So what I'm doing in this space in particular? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think better than anyone, I understand like the limitations of the, of the things that I, have to, that I develop. And so I, I think a lot about which, which distributions and which use cases are covered and which are not covered. And so I think um, we, we've done a reasonable job covering unconstrained target distributions, unconstrained continuous target distributions. That's mostly what I focused on in this talk. But what about if you have constraints? What if you're working in the simplex? What if you have non-negativity constraints? How do you incorporate all that very naturally? And underlying Stein's method, I think you know the original derivation of Stein's method basically was like an exercise in integration by parts. Like you do some integral and some in derivatives get replaced with derivatives vanish because you're doing some integral. And those things become more complicated when you have constraints. And so I've been working um, with uh, postdoc at Microsoft on like constrained versions of this that are more natural for um, you know, other target distributions. And so I think a lot about like two things in the space. One is really scalability. If it's not fast enough for someone, how do we make it faster? Um, and the other is like applicability. Like if it doesn't cover your target distribution, how do we deal with that? And I think there are a lot, there are lots of questions there. And there are also questions about tailoring. Like, you know, if I'm, I've given you, I'm giving you discrepancies that control convergence and distribution, but that's actually a pretty strong thing. It says that for any, you know, I'm approximating every bounded continuous function well. Um, and maybe that's not what you care about. Maybe you just care about the mean, or maybe you just care about the means and the variances. If that's all you care about, can you do something that's more tailored to your, your, you know, your downstream demands? And that's actually much more difficult, it turns out, but that's something that I'm thinking about actively. Are there any areas of biology that you're especially interested in collaborating on or interested in or have sort of gotten word that these methods would, you know, make big impact? That's interesting. I mean, there's certainly areas of biology that I'm interested in. And uh, I don't know that, I'm not sure about the intersection between that and like the use of these methods. So I've been working a good bit in like cancer immunotherapy of late and trying to understand, you know, what are reasonable biomarkers for, um, you know, positive response, like, you know, longer survival in response to cancer immunotherapy. I haven't yet thought about like using these methods in that context, but I would love, I mean, if you, if anyone here has ideas about how it could be used in your work or um, places where, or like versions of this that are, you know, ways in which this fails, but it could be useful in the future. I would love to, I'd love to learn about that. 